Our next presenter, thank you so much, Grace. Um, our next presenter is Sev Fowles, um, who received his PhD here at Michigan um, and is currently Chair of American Studies and Associate Professor of Anthropology at Barnard College. He's an archaeologist whose work examines the images, landscapes, countercultures, religions, indigenous worlds, and colonial histories of the American Southwest. He has directed various collaborative fieldwork projects in New Mexico, from excavations at a 13th century ancestral Pueblo village to rock art surveys in the Rio Grande do Norte National Monument, to excavations at a Spanish colonial village, ex to excavations at a 1960s hippie commune, which has to be kind of interesting. His work prioritizes collaborations with descendant communities, most recently with Picuris Pueblo, on whose behalf he is co-directing a new landscape survey of late pre-colonial agricultural systems, and with the Comanche Nation, the latter of which resulted in a recent PBS documentary on the tribe's 18th century rock art traditions. His works include an archaeology of doings, secularism, and the study of Pueblo religion, the Oxford Handbook of Southwest Archaeology, and numerous essays. The title of his presentation is Image Capture and Imperial Design in 18th Century New Mexico. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, thanks so much uh, to uh, Rob and all the other organizers uh, for you know, the invitation to, uh, to join in this celebration. I have to say it's really powerful to, uh, to be back in this community, um, which is surprising in a way because I always felt that one of the benefits of uh, doing graduate work at Michigan is that you never actually leave. Um, you know, I uh, work at Columbia uh, University where uh, I'm really uh, lucky to have as colleagues Zoe Crossland, who I overlapped with here at Michigan, uh, as well as Terry Daltroy, uh, who does undergraduate uh, work at uh, Michigan. We've even established uh, a new tradition of 007 um, in uh, the Upper West Side, but the graduate students at Columbia have no idea why we call it that. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, you know, I've always felt that the life, uh, the intellectual life of Michigan um, has traveled with me wherever um, I go. Um, this has been especially true for me, at least in the field. Um, my research, as Rob said, is based in uh, New Mexico, just north of uh, Santa Fe. And, uh, you know, you can't swing a Golden Marshallton in, uh, in Santa Fe without hitting a Michigan archaeologist. Uh, my old uh, dissertation sponsor, uh, Dick Ford, retired out there. Um, I collaborate all the time with Mike Adler, um, Sunday I sell both Michigan alums. Uh, so, uh, you know, I could go on and on. But simply put, uh, I feel that depth of, of my, uh, um, uh, you know, debt to Mich the Michigan community constantly. Okay. Um, with that said, let me turn quickly to the paper. Uh, I'm going to comment uh, this morning on two issues. Um, the first is the archaeology of imperialism. Uh, and here I'm going to be working with quite a stripped down uh, definition of imperialism as expansionistic politics employing force. Uh, this opens up space for us to uh, examine a range of imperial formations including the highly mobile polities that uh, Thomas Barfield uh, has referred to in an Asian context uh, as shadow empires, uh, and also what historians of the American West uh, have begun to write about as kinetic empires. Second, I'm interested in the uh, question of iconology, which uh, I follow W.J.T. Mitchell and Hans Belting uh, as thinking about uh, in terms of just an anthropology of images, uh, of their animating logics, and uh, especially of the role of image production in uh, political life. So putting these uh, two themes in conversation, as I've done in the uh, title, I'm interested in the question of imperial design uh, in its double sense as uh, both a question of political ambition uh, as well as the iconographic uh, representation of that ambition. And at the end of my comments, if I have time, uh, I'm going to zoom in on the more specific uh, matter of image capture, by which, in mind, uh, by which I have in mind a parallel world of predation uh, in which the captives are actually not people, but rather images. Uh, and in keeping with our theme, I'll be grappling with all of this in a particular intercultural space, uh, the American Southwest of the early colonial period. 
Okay, uh, the Southwest, as all of you know, um, has long been home to a plurality of indigenous groups uh, from the more or less sedentary Pueblo communities um, to the much more mobile Athabascan communities that since the uh, 14th century uh, have lived in their midst uh, to the Numic speaking communities up in the north uh, on the, in the Great Basin and Rocky Mountains. Uh, one could go on and on. Uh, in the 16th century, however, the uh, Spanish, of course, aggressively forced their way into this region, establishing a colony, New Mexico, uh, in the Rio Grande Valley. And in the 17th century, uh, the French followed suit, advancing their own imperial designs uh, just to the east in that massive territory um, then known as Louisiana. So by the start of the 18th century, and the, and the 18th century really is my focus uh, for this talk, um, the uh, Southwest was an intercultural space only in the uh, most euphemistic of uh, terms. Um, on the ground, it was quite a violent landscape of competing European imperialisms and varied anti-imperialist uh, and uh, liberation struggles uh, by colonized people. Now, uh, over the past uh, couple of decades, uh, historians have complicated this already very complex uh, picture further uh, by bringing to light the impressive degree to which some indigenous peoples actually had their own imperial uh, designs, uh, most notoriously the uh, Comanche, who relocated onto the bison-rich southern plains at the start of the uh, 18th century and then used this as a base of operations uh, to conduct military and diplomatic uh, expeditions over a really vast swath of the mid-continent, uh, effectively from Alberta in the north nearly as far as Mexico City. Pekka Hamalainen's uh, landmark study, The Comanche Empire, published in 2008, is the central text for this new Comanche historiography. Uh, Hamalainen reads across regions and archives, and in the process, you know, he totally upends that traditional, somewhat racist image of the Comanche as sort of um, purveyors of chaos, uh, barbarians as it's often put. Um, he exposes instead the sophisticated ways that Comanche groups coordinated diplomacy, maneuvered economically, and waged war on multiple frontiers, all with a scale uh, and ambition that rivaled, if not surpassed, uh, many European um, nations. In fact, the Taos area um, where I work was clearly targeted uh, early on by the Comanche as a place where the Spanish uh, could obtain horses, uh, where pasturage could be commandeered during times of ecological crisis, uh, and where Pueblo trade fairs uh, could be used as regional marketplaces for uh, Comanche goods. In fact, uh, Hamelainen goes so far as to describe Taos uh, as a colonial outpost of greater Comancheria uh, during this period. Now, uh, as good Michigan archeologists, we should be interested in this new history uh, for two reasons, I think. First, it demands uh, um, a revision to, or at least a significant expansion of, uh, that archeological model of Plains Pueblo interaction uh, developed right here in the museum by my mentor, John Speth, and another of his former students, Kate Spielman. Um, their work emphasized the mutualistic exchange of uh, Pueblo corn for plains uh, bison, meat for uh, carbohydrates. And uh, this has been deservedly influential on uh, a lot of our understandings of the evolutionary relationship between foragers uh, and farmers. Ecological mutualism uh, remains a crucial idea, I think, but we're now also challenged to explain the subsequent rise uh, of much more exploitative relations uh, in which the balance of power tilted strongly towards those highly militarized uh, communities out there on the plains. In short, we need some way of accounting for a historical shift from mutualism to imperialism. Now, there's a lot to say uh, about all of this, but uh, it's clear, I think, that the spread of horses um, played a decisive role. You know, imperialism has always been uh, at its heart an infrastructural uh, undertaking from Roman roads to British ships to American railroads to uh, Russian pipelines uh, of the current day. And for uh, the Comanche, equestrianism clearly was that infrastructure uh, of movement that newly fueled um, a mode of predatory politics. Now, uh, the second reason we should be interested uh, is more methodological. 
If we accept Hamelainen's model, uh, we as archaeologists seem to be in the pretty awkward and somewhat embarrassing position of having somehow missed the material traces of an entire indigenous empire. Um, in fact, up to the research I'm going to share with you in a moment, uh, there wasn't any Comanche archaeology really to speak of, especially in New Mexico. You know, how could this be? What's going on? Well, I've uh, taken it upon myself to redress this situation, uh, working collaboratively with many wonderful uh, colleagues in the Comanche Nation, as well as uh, my longtime conspirator, Lindsay Montgomery, who you'll be uh, hearing from tomorrow. Uh, our work is focused uh, on the Taos region, uh, which, uh, as I've indicated, was a target uh, of Comanche activities. And for a variety of preservational reasons, uh, we've come to center our work in and around the Rio Grande Gorge, which is uh, pictured here. And what we quickly came to realize is that uh, when you actually go looking for it, um, there is plenty of evidence of the Comanche uh, ancestors uh, in this region. There are, in, uh, for instance, base camps. Um, here you're looking at a site we discovered in the middle of the Rio Grande Gorge um, where the remains of a couple dozen teepees, um, or teepee rings rather, could still be traced beneath the sagebrush. We carefully uh, mapped all the rocks on the surface um, at the site and discovered that most were arranged loosely into uh, um, circles. The idea being, which I've highlighted here for you, the idea being that these were once um, weighting down uh, the uh, canvases of, um, or hides of, of teepees themselves. Now, you know, this, a site like this was probably occupied repeatedly for short periods of time uh, while the Comanche were conducting uh, trading or raiding expeditions in the area. Not surprisingly, there aren't many artifacts visible on the surface. We've not excavated um, out of respect for um, our tribe, tribal um, consultants and partners, um, but we have been given permission to conduct um, metal detector survey, and that's been pretty productive. Um, in this slide, for instance, you're seeing some of the metal objects that we found actually in those TB um, uh, rings themselves, uh, a metal point, uh, some musket balls, uh, a lightning awl, uh, and even um, a fragment of a Spanish bridle, which was probably actually taken, um, acquired during a raid. So my point is that there are architectural and artifactual um, remains uh, to discuss, but by far the most robust archaeology at these sites uh, is iconographic. Simply put, the Comanche who passed through left behind thousands of rock art images on the local basalt boulders, and these tell us a great deal about who exactly was there and why. The images are lightly scratched. Most are quick and sketchy renderings. Uh, often they're faint and difficult to see. And uh, while they were all um, created in a Pueblo region, they're not, as I hope you can see here, Pueblo images. Uh, rather, the content draws us east over the Rocky Mountains and out onto the plains. This is really the art of interlopers, you might say. In this panel, uh, the tracing of it, for instance, um, we're looking at something that overlooks uh, the very 18th century uh, camp we just considered. In fact, this could be a graphic representation of the teepees that once stood there. It's a crowded image uh, that seems to have developed in an accretional fashion. Uh, at the uh, center are two columns of horses, each mounted by a pair of riders. Uh, most of the lead riders carry feathered lances, which is a signifier of their uh, uh, success as warriors. Most of the horses have bridles or perhaps even scalps uh, uh, as well. These are also signifiers of status. We might say equine status, however. Uh, bearing all of this in mind and the fact that this was um, situated in a military camp, we can imagine uh, this as a representation of the warriors who led um, one of the many cam Comanche campaigns into this region. Uh, around that central columns, those central columns, 25 teepees have then been scratched or braided. Um, and the rule of thumb here is that each teepee would have probably housed about five people. So, you know, we might conclude that this represents uh, the commemoration of a war party uh, that included, say, 125 folks. 
Now, in the Plains uh, rock art uh, uh, studies uh, tradition, uh, this sort of image is part of what's been called uh, biographic rock art, um, which seems to have begun in the 17th century, but then really took over Plains visual culture during the 18th century. Uh, and what's most distinctive about this tradition is that it's strongly focused on the documentation, documentation of actual historical events. Uh, there's an almost archival sensibility uh, at work here, the goal being to create images that establish a material record um, of events. You know, today uh, we are only able to grasp the broad outlines, um, though the assumption is that uh, in the past those raised uh, within this tradition's graphic conventions would have been able to read it as a kind of, of picture writing, as Mallory put it uh, way back when. Here uh, in this panel, uh, we might speculate, for instance, uh, that another military campaign is being uh, commemorated. We see seven mounted warriors. There's a contingent of foot soldiers. And off in the bottom right, three bison have been depicted, perhaps indicating that this party paused uh, in their activities uh, to engage in a hunt. There are other noteworthy details, particularly the armor that each horse seems to be wearing. Uh, now, the indigenous use of leather armor uh, for their horses mirrored um, the, uh, the uh, metal armor of Spanish war horses. Um, it was only used uh, during a short period of time during the early um, 18th century, and the Comanche, in fact, were uh, one of the um, uh, primary groups known for using uh, hide armor on their horses. So this is some of the evidence that we've mobilized to initially affiliate the rock art. The strongest evidence, however, um, for a Comanche uh, cultural affiliation uh, has emerged from our consultation with the tribe uh, itself. We've hosted various uh, groups of tribal elders and youth groups as well over the years. And here I want to especially acknowledge Jimmy Artiberry, the farmer, former um, tribal historic preservation officer, Jane Myers, uh, and Mary Wiaki, the latter of whom is uh, portrayed in this slide, helping us think about how we might read um, one of these uh, rock art panels. All of these, um, you know, our colleagues and good friends now who've helped us think through certain uh, lexical details through the social context of the iconography's creation, as well as its relationship to the surrounding landscape. And what I've been most impressed uh, by is the degree to which uh, so much of this rock art overwhelmingly uh, was preoccupied with, uh, as I've indicated, the documentation of specific historical events, particularly of a military nature. In some panels, it's a successful horse raid. Uh, here, for instance, Comanche warriors are depicted uh, in the center, and the horses uh, they've tallied are off there to the right, metonymically uh, represented as arcing lines, um, the neck of the horse standing in for its, um, its body. In other panels, we encounter battle scenes, uh, like this attack on a teepee village. Um, there's a great deal of action and movement in these images, uh, which is really interesting uh, to me insofar as the pre-colonial rock art, pretty much across the uh, American West, was far more static than this. Uh, pre-colonial rock art uh, has deep, um, had deep theological significance. Uh, in some cases, we might think about it as a prayer for rain, for example. But it almost never presents us with this sort of scene um, in which an artist is trying to document lived history. And as Vine Deloria Jr. so carefully outlined in his landmark uh, text, God is Red, um, most indigenous communities uh, in North America seem to have traditionally placed the existential weight on being in place rather than um, uh, being in history, almost to the exclusion of being in history. Okay, so how are we to think about this explosion of historically oriented visual culture then? Well, in a forthcoming article, Lindsay and I um, argue that it surely isn't a coincidence that this iconographic revolution took place shortly after the arrival of European colonists. Uh, I want you to consider this image with me briefly. Uh, it's a detail of a sprawling battle um, that was painted on uh, a hide canvas um, in New Mexico, likely by a Spanish-trained but indigenous artist or group of artists at the behest of a Spanish patron, uh, probably right at the start of the 18th century. 
the panis, panel is um, uh, assumed, or the painting rather, is assumed to represent a real military battle. We argue about which one. Um, we see a group of mounted indigenous warriors here under the orders of a Spanish captain attacking a settlement of pedestrian warriors thought to be Apache. Uh, now, on one hand, this image uh, fits comfortably within the European uh, genre of history painting, has particularly strong affinities uh, with the battle scenes adorning medieval tapestries. On the other hand, it was the sort of image um, that would have also circulated in colonial New Mexico, minimally among those indigenous artisans who created it, but probably more broadly um, in uh, indigenous circles as well. And you know, highlighting uh, the main action, uh, we confront a pretty um, uh, sim familiar image, a mounted indigenous warrior reaching out to strike his pedestrian foe. This is structurally quite similar to the images produced by the Comanche right at about the same time. Uh, and here's you know, the comparison I want to draw um, to your attention uh, with the tracing of that European hide painting on the top uh, and two Comanche rock art panels uh, down below. Again, in um, both, we encounter a dominant equestrian warrior striking uh, an opponent. In fact, uh, there is some evidence that the Comanche were learning new modes of historically based image production directly from uh, the Spanish. What you're looking at here is a sheet of paper uh, that the New Mexican governor sent to a Comanche captain, Aquara in 1786, asking um, uh, him to indicate by means of lines and signs the results of a joint Comanche-Spanish campaign against the Apache. It's a remarkable document um, because this um, particular symbolic uh, set of conventions um, used here are explained to us. Uh, here, for example, are the uh, signs that Iquiracapa was um, supposed to use to indicate a cap uh, Apaches that were captured or killed. Here are the uh, signs for uh, captured horses. And it looks like uh, the Comanche, um, at some point, took this um, iconographic um, lexicon, uh, these conventions, and started using them for their own purposes. I draw your attention here to uh, the tracing of a rock art panel, um, one of many that we found in the gorge, that pretty clearly shows a Comanche tally, uh, though of course um, of what we no longer know. The key point, uh, I think, is um, that we confront here that same archival impulse, uh, an almost bureaucratic logic of record keeping that I think was picked up in military context from the Spanish. Okay, uh, in my final five minutes, I hope I have five minutes left, I want to quickly uh, turn to the iconographic pattern um, that interests me most in all of this. In a nutshell, it has to do with what I think is a shift from the iconographic documentation of, say, the number of uh, captured horses or captured enemies to the capture of images themselves. As we began to uh, archaeologically document the rock art in the Rio Grande Gorge, we quickly noticed that the uh, Comanche rock art, far more than uh, any other rock art tradition, was created specifically on top of earlier images, often in a way um, that those images, those earlier images, were incorporated into the subsequent uh, Comanche composition. There was a special focus um, on serpentine lines, like this archaic panel, uh, for instance, which seems to have been drawn into uh, a Comanche artist's um, uh, artistic um, imagination on this particular battle when he or she um, scratched this complex battle scene. Here is uh, another example, a boulder with a pecked serpentine glyph, perhaps a thousand or more years old, that a Comanche artist, again, seems to have been attracted to, targeted, and incorporated into the uh, commemoration of a successful bison hunt. In still other examples, uh, the serpentine images are themselves annotated. In this photograph, uh, we confront a Pueblo horned uh, serpent uh, pecked onto a boulder. Here's our tracing uh, of that glyph uh, to which scratch marks uh, appear to have been subsequently added by a Comanche visitor. The serpent now has been given a breath line and there's a second serpent scratched just off to the right. 
How do we explain this pattern? Well, uh, the Comanche, along with their Shoshone relatives, were known as the snakes. Indeed, the Comanche uh, sign for, um, or the sign for Comanche in plain sign language was a snaking hand movement across the chest. And through dialogue with tribal members, uh, we've begun to think about this as a kind of Comanche signature in which the serpentine art of earlier groups in the region was appropriated and recoded. As our work continued, however, this pattern of image appropriation grew more complex, though. We found other images like this one, uh, in which a pectarchaic design thousands of years old was added to, was expanded through the addition of scratched 18th century guns, effectively turning uh, the original image into a Comanche tally. Uh, perhaps of the weapons they successfully stole from their Spanish opponents uh, in a battle. Or we encountered uh, things like Pueblo Shields glyphs. Uh, again, I've traced an example for you here, to which were ex added extensions. Uh, in this case, uh, a series of lines and a horse. Here's my favorite example, though. A Pueblo Shield that's been modified simply through the uh, addition of a scratched line across it. In fact, uh, it was this last very subtle annotation of a Pueblo shield uh, that led to a kind of interpretive breakthrough for us when Jimmy Artiberry, then the Comanche uh, Tippo, commented in passing that yes, uh, this was all his ancestors really needed to do to capture someone else's image. Drawing a line uh, through the image was enough to make it uh, appropriate it and make it Comanche. There are many additional images I could share with you um, that adhere to this pattern. Suffice it to say that what I think we're looking at is not just a shift uh, towards historical or strongly narrative iconography, but also a remarkable new tradition of conducting image production as a form of imperial conquest. A new tradition in which uh, ancestral Comanche peoples were expanding into New Mexico and appropriating the art of other groups, European and indigenous alike, adding to it, and thereby saying, in effect, this is mine now. We're here, we're taking over. What then uh, can we take away from this brief survey of 18th century Comanche rock art? Well, to answer this uh, concluding question, I'm going to enlist the help um, of a friend and cultural uh, um, critic, uh, historian, also New Mex uh, Native American um, uh, Museum of, uh, sorry, National Museum of American Indian uh, curator, Paul Chat Smith. Um, in his wonderful book uh, entitled Everything You Know About Indians is Wrong, uh, Smith writes the following. He writes, contrary to what most people, Indians and non-Indians alike now believe, our true history is one of constant change, technological innovation, uh, and intense curiosity about the world. How else do you explain our instantaneous ad adaptation to horses, rifles, flour, and knives? Smith, Smith is writing uh, specifically here about his Comanche ancestors' enthusiasm for appropriating and reimagining European technologies. And to be sure, there's a wide literature surrounding the way European horses and guns in particular leapt across that settler indigenous divide and were actively used uh, to bring about a profound restructuring of plain societies. In dialogue with that historiography, my goal um, today has been to point out that settler colonialism uh, and indeed imperialism more generally establishes the historical conditions for the intercultural movement of iconologies, uh, no less than technologies. In such contexts, understandings of what an image or has the, is or has the potential to be can travel as fast as horses, and the resulting images can be wielded as aggressively as guns. With that, I'll uh, leave it there, and thank you once again very much for the invitation to speak. Thank you so much for that, Sev. It's fantastic. Our next speaker, <coughs> excuse me, this morning is Julia Saltini Simorari, who's assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology right here at UM, and she's our, assist, our curator of Mediterranean archaeology in UMA. Welcome, 
to us. Her research seeks to harness the Mediterranean's rich archaeological record to reconstruct, model, um, to reconstruct and model diverse aspects of culture contact. In particular, she's interested in understanding how small and large-scale socioeconomic dynamics affect long-term fluctuations in connectivity. Her work mostly concentrates on the interactions between Italy and the Aegean in the first millennium BC. While her PhD at Oxford University investigated long-term, large-scale patterns of exchange and migration between these two regions, more recently she's focused on the Greek colonization of southern Italy, where she's conducting a multidisciplinary project titled Ancient Mediterranean Interactions Between Colonizers and Indigenous Populations a collaboration between the universities of Tübingen, Leiden, and VU University in Amsterdam, the project combines comprehensive bioarchaeological analyses with more traditional material culture studies in order to reconstruct interregional mobility and admixture patterns and to gauge their impact on the social and cultural development of coastal and inland settlements. The title of her presentation is Following Divergent Paths of Contact, a multidisciplinary approach to the Greek colonization in southern Italy. Okay, um, can you hear me? Awesome. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak at this session and thank you all for being here. Uh, today, I would like to take you along to follow the, these two diverging paths of uh, interaction between Aegean newcomers coming to southern Italy and local indigenous communities um, coming, I think maybe if I step away it's a bit better, coming, um, set, uh, living uh, on the coast and in the inland of the region of Basilicata. I will first have to give you, in order to do so, a short background to situate where we are and what we're talking about, and I'll, then I'll explain briefly um, what happens before the Greek colonizers, or actually migrants is probably the more correct term in this context, arrived. Then we'll look at how these paths of uh, interaction diverged from the coast to inland. Um, and finally, hopefully, I will be able to say something more general about how to st study <coughs> these complex interaction processes. Um, but just to give you an overall, um, uh, the overall con the historical context that we're talking about, uh, I will cover three very dense centuries uh, that basically shape the Mediterranean from the end of the early Iron Age to uh, the 6th century BC. So in uh, relative chronological terms, is, this is the real the transition between the early Iron Age and what we more generally consider the classical world. And this is a very complex multifactorial process that involves various variables, including demographic fig growth, the increase in social complexity, uh, exponential increase in Mediterranean exchanges, and within this context, we also have, in many regions of the Mediterranean, catalyzing further local dynamics, the arrival of migrants from the Aegean, and also, but I'm not gonna talk about it now, from um, the, the Near East. And uh, you can see here the span of the Greek colonization. Uh, the, the picture that I gave you here is just to give you an idea of how intense this transition is. Um, the illustration is not from Southern Italy just because we don't have people that draw that well for Southern Italy, but it kind of gives you the idea of what we're talking about. We start with small scale villages, probably with kinship organization, and we end up with um, proto-urban or urban settlements in many areas of the Mediterranean, among which is southern Italy. Uh, and this is sort of uh, the, broad, the broad transition scheme uh, of, how this, uh, uh, of how this happens. We have um, the 8th century, which is still the early Iron Age, and we'll see how this, these different stages occur in, on the coast and in inland. Um, and then in the 7th century, we have the earliest arrival of Greek migrants. Uh, and then in the 6th century, finally the big transition to this kind of more urban settlement. So, um, geographically, I'm going to focus on southern Italy, which is one of the areas that, ha that was particularly affected by the migration of Aegean people to uh, the Mediterranean. And, and here you can see the two colonies of Ceres and Metaponto. They eventually become colonies at the end of this transition. Um, and then in, in, in red and then in blue, uh, important indigenous sites of the time. We'll talk a little bit um, 
about in Coronata, you can see there are some sites that are closer to the coast and some sites that are further inland in the, in the mountains. Um, and these are the areas that diverge in the seventh century. <coughs> but when we start our narrative in the eighth century, in the early Iron Age, patterns are very similar across the region. And long distance exchange, there is no colonization, yes, is basically um, uh, focused around the arrival of specific uh, luxury um, goods. In particular, uh, we get amber for very long distances, probably from the Adriatic. Uh, we get black gla glass beads uh, that have a gigantic distribution from Italy to Afghanistan, um, and uh, certain um, metal imports as well. All of these, we do have a little bit of Greek pottery, but it's extremely rare and it's found in settlement. Most of these luxury goods, goods we, found, we find in few very wealthy indigenous burials. And the general trend across the early Iron Age is for these burials to increase the amount of wealth um, that is deposited there, but also the amount of, uh, of great goods and imports. And this increase in imports is only possible because throughout the end of the early Iron Age, there is also this uh, parallel increase in Mediterranean exchanges globally. Things, however, start to change when we get to the 7th century. And this is where we can date sort of the earliest arrival of Aegean migrants. And here we're moving to the coast. We'll get to the inland later <coughs> in a minute. What starts happening on the coast is that we, um, we see archaeologically a lot of context in all these settlements, whether we're talking about uh, settlements that eventually become colonies or the more inland, traditionally indigenous settlements, um, a mix of features, funerary features, architectural feature, but also uh, material pottery production that come from both Aegean tradition and local indigenous early Iron, tra early Iron Age tradition mixed together um, without any seeming attempt to uh, create like, separated spaces by, for instance, geographical origin. And I, I'm going to focus here briefly on the site of Incoronata because this can give us uh, a more granular idea of how this interaction actually worked uh, at a very, very local scale of personal interactions. Incoronata uh, in the early Iron Age is an important indigenous site. It has, it has a very big cemetery. Uh, and then during the 7th century, it has this mixed phase when we start seeing um, a lot of this mixed feature appear. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's been excavated over the years by many universities. Here I will focus on sort of the central area over there, which has been excavated by Iran University, with whom I collaborate. Uh, and in this area, clearly we have a ritual space, which is associated with a production space as well. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. This is by no means um, uh, exceptional for Mediterranean context in this period. We often have sanctuaries associated with productive spaces, particularly of, of pottery and metal. So there is a lot to say about in Coronata, and I absolutely don't have the time to explain everything. So I will focus on a couple of key contexts just to give you an idea. Uh, and in particular, I will look at um, the evidence of local pottery production and of ritual performances. And you can see um, in blue is where um, a kiln for the firing of pottery was found together with um, discard of uh, misfires. And in red, uh, where the ritual depositions are concentrated on the, to the south are the early Iron Age ones, and then in continuity, but to the north, in continuity in terms of um, of, um, of actual rituals, but with different objects to the north are the seventh century ones. So if we look at pottery production, what is, um, what is important to know is that both Greek and indigenous pottery was produced locally in the same kilns, but they were produced uh, according to, and this was, this we could tell both from the finding of misfires and archaeometric analysis, um, both kinds of pottery were produced along their own traditional chain operatoires, but uh, there was this shared um, artisanal space where uh, these, both types of pottery could be produced. And it's also important to note that the vast majority of pottery remains indigenous throughout the life of the site. So the Greeks are sort of guests within this broader indigenous community. Um, the quality of the pottery is some of the most exceptional for the Mediterranean at this period. And here I put two examples 
the pot on the top is, is more than a meter tall. It's, it's, um, it's uh, decorated in relief. And um, what is evident from especially the decorated painted pottery is uh, um, an, an adoption of themes, iconographic themes that in the same times are very important for the elaboration of Greek elite ideology. And so there is another element of sharing, not only of burial spaces, but of iconographic and elite ideology probably at, at the same time. Here you can see two ritual contexts. Uh, they usually involve the deposition in pits of uh, pottery uh, on a bed of pebbles, and, and, um, and the pottery in the 7th century starts being both Greek and indigenous, and we have Greek imports, but also the locally produced pottery that comes directly from Incoronata, and these are usually mixed with animal bones as well. You can see the head of a calf uh, at the bottom of this slide. Um, a final, and then I have to move on, but another very important and I think beautiful um, uh, assemblage which gives you an idea of, of how these two communities at that point became intertwined is the final deposition in the central building that we have in the excavation area, which is this absidal building over there to the left. Um, at the entrance on a bed of pebbles again, um, three pots were left in situ and broken there, and then the site was closed and abandoned at the, at the beginning of the 6th century. And this included uh, a, pox, uh, um, a Greek shape for mixing wine, uh, which was at the end defunctionalized by cutting its foot. Uh, and then two indigenous shapes for drinking. Uh, and beautifully, two spools, which are traditionally used in Italian indigenous community by elite women to produce particularly complicated, um, a particularly complicated kind of textile border. Uh, and there would be a lot to say about uh, how gender is important within this interaction, uh, but I do not have time, but I did want to let you know that this aspect also is, is, exists and it's quite important. Things change in the course of the sixth century, particularly in the second half. The site of Incoronata and the other sites, indigenous sites along the coast are abandoned. And the site of Metaponto, which looked a little bit like in Coronata in the, in the 7th century, so again, mixed uh, context, starts start being structured much more like a, an urban center. Uh, we start seeing um, the beginning of a regular street, street grid and um, a fortification wall. The cemeteries move outside of the area. Uh, and the, the settlement becomes much more centralized. The early Iron Age sites are usually just sparse nuclei of huts. Um, and we associate them with kinship groups. Um, and, and this is a common characteristic in this period for all of Italic settlements. Um, and, so, and within this context, there is a main square where we, have, we start having sanctuaries that at the beginning are just uh, small uh, buildings in perishable materials, which is beautiful uh, clay decoration, but then become the sort of big stone temples that we all associate with Greekness in some ways. Um, so, and at, at this point, traces of indigenous occupation start to disappear from the material record of the coast. And for a long time, this was interpreted as, oh, this is the Greek colonization. We have it from literary sources. The Greeks arrived, they kickled the indigenous people out, uh, the Incoronata is destroyed, and they established their beautiful colony. There has been a lot of debate in the last 20 to 30 years based on post-colonial theory and also on, on all this contradictory evidence that we found on the ground for the earlier colonization about whether this interpretation is true or not. And lately to this, I added my own studies, which was a broad bioarchaeological analysis, biodistance analysis of um, both indigenous and colonial cemeteries along the coast. And what we found, surprisingly or not, depending on what your theoretical framework was, uh, is that actually the majority of the people in the colony are still of indigenous descent. And what this tells me, uh, coming from post-colonial perspective, is that what they were constructing there in the colonies on the coast was um, a new form of a, a civic collective identity that, that had really not so much to do with how we think of ethnic identities in, at, at the time. And, um, and this is, to me, logical if you see what happens in the 7th century, where also there was no incentive to, um, the, to separate different ethnic identity or geographical origins. And so 
this is what the biological evidence uh, seems to indicate. Things look very different in the interior of Incoronata. So um, there in the 7th century, there, there, there is full continuity with early Iron Age uh, patterns. So we, f we continue to find, um, and granted we don't have a lot of settlement evidence, but what we see is that we continue to find this pattern of um, very wealthy, um, uh, certain very wealthy um, graves which have a lot of material that tends to be repeated, um, a lot of amber, so the same trade routes are still operating in this period, um, a lot of metal, um, but also um, increasing amount of finance which probably arrived mediated through uh, the Greek, the, the, the Aegean connections because most of, I think all of the finance in this period comes from Egypt, and so there wasn't any previous contact before. So they're taking advantage of this presence of the, the, the Aegean, Aegean migrants on the coast, but they're doing their own thing. Um, and this continues actually into the sixth century. There is some change in the sense that um, uh, more Greek banqueting equipment is included in, in these graves, again, all, but always accumulated um, uh, following the, the same kinds of conceptual framework. We still have a lot of, a lot of ambers in, the, in these wealthy burials. And the Greek pottery enters the assemblages, but it's always accompanied also by indigenous pottery. And we can be sure that they're not used in the same way because a lot of this banqueting equipment is found in, in women's graves. And this would be completely unthinkable for classical Greece. And so, and so things are adopted but adapted. And another very good example comes from a building in the um, site of Torre di Satriano in the mountainous interiors where Greek artists, and this is a building obviously of some important person in the community, where the, the local artisans from a nearby colony of Taranto are called and they locally produce with local clay this kind of the same relief decoration that we find in temples uh, on the coast, but that there is used just to decorate the house of the, of the local authority. So um, just to like, conclude, I, I think that what, 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 what we can say about the like, quick overview that, that I transported you through is that um, while during the early Iron Age, local communities where both in the interior and the coast are primed to be open to Mediterranean contacts, usually used in the context of local competition, which becomes fiercer as times goes by. And we can see that in the, the, the continuous accum accumulation of wealth in the graves, in, um, in, the, in, the, in the important graves of people in the inland. Um, the trajectory diverged in the seventh century, um, I think probably, and perhaps obviously because in the coast, there was much easier access to uh, the people that were coming and there was much greater intimacy of contact. So this created a long phase of intense negotiation, the traces of which we can see directly in the kind of context that we see at in Coronata, for example, um, and, and sharing and thinking through um, ideas about, at the very minimum, religion and gender and elite ideology which in the long run, and here we're talking about a process that must have taken at the very least three generations, so it's a considerable amount of time, uh, eventually um, produces the emergence of new collective identities where, where both have, both the Aegean migrants, but to a very large extent also indigenous people have full agency. In the interior, the pattern is different. There is greater resistance, and uh, foreign objects are adopted, but they're always also adapted to local conceptual frameworks. And this remained unaltered. And I have to note here that um, indigenous development in, 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 in inland Basilicata kind of continues along this trend up to the Roman conquest. So it's not something that at some point changes. Um, but these are not uh, isolated communities. They're fully tapped in to Mediterranean contact. They just use them in a completely different way. Um, and so going towards my conclusion, what, what I would like, and this is a thought experiment, of course, but what I would like to say here is that um, this kind of multi-generational, multi-variable, and multi-scalar processes can be, in my opinion, best understood by thinking through them uh, with the concept of, of feedback loops. 
And here I, I have to apologize because I know that this is a very ugly and cramped slide, uh, but, but you don't, I don't have to go through this in full detail. Um, what this does is kind of summarizing, I think, what kind of pro feedback loop here we're talking about for this period, and just very much in synthesis, um, what I've seen, and I've, I've tried to describe to you very briefly, is that uh, increased social competition, which comes out of dynamics of the early Iron Age, which I will not get into right now, um, created a general search for new, search for new resources in these communities, uh, and that itself um, produced the expansion, both in the quantity and quality of things that were exchanged, but also of the kind of geographical extension of this personal um, and, and, and personal reach of, of these exchanges. Uh, and this, in turn, then would have increased, mo increased mobility and, most importantly, the availability of resources, which then would have fed back into availability of resources do, to be used in local social competition. Within this cycle, um, what I think is a, the critical turning point where really the balance of the region is upset is when artisans from the Aegean come and start producing their own fancy pottery locally within these indigenous communities. And this is where uh, availability completely changes. It's no longer something that you have, that some people can control because they have access to the merchants, the people can, that come yearly with new Greek pots and things like that. Uh, they're there. They're the people that you live with, live with or, or, or have contact with all the time. Um, and, and that sort of makes this process, um, I, I don't want to say spiral out of control, but certainly intensify it progressively. And this means that, in the, but, <clears throat> but this is also where the direction of the coast and the interior really diverge, because while this is true for the settlements on the coast, in the interior, of course, these kind of products are closer but they're still a ways away. They're not in your house. They're not in your settlement. And so there's still this kind of contact to manage and, and, and elite people in the interior are still able to control the process better than the people in, in sort of the, the coastal communities. Um, so to conclude, I didn't take the, the image of the feedback loop just out of my own head. Uh, this is something that is drawn from complex system theory. We talked briefly about it also in, in yesterday's discussion. Uh, and I, I do not have the time to get too much into the, the details, um, but I think they can, these kind of models can be very useful to understand. And sorry, here, uh, I, I also wanted to highlight, and I forgot the fact that um, this is obviously a feedback loop that plays across two different scales, the local scale and the global Mediterranean scale. So none of the changes that we see at the local level would be possible without the big global changes that we see on the Mediterranean scale, but obviously vice versa. These things are continuously connected. And so uh, complex system theory models, the, the way these things work, uh, in particular, I do find resilience theory some of the most useful because they can help um, understand system that works on a multi-scalar level, but also that are not hierarchically organized, such as is the Mediterranean in this period. These are all just villages that are doing their own things. Um, and can explain a little bit better the sudden accelerated shifts in, uh, in, in equilibrium. So to conclude whether we want to use complex system theory or not, uh, I think my main point today to you would be that if we really want to understand these very complex interaction processes that takes many generations, operate at different scales, and so on, we should probably start, stop, stop reasoning through a linear chain of cause and effect links and start reasoning much more in a circular uh, idea of feedback loops between small and large scale changes. And this is it. I don't know. We are going to take a 10 minute break. Um, I, think I was realizing last night that it's kind of like an SAA or AAA. If you've got a session that goes on all morning, usually there's some kind of break in there. So we're going to take a break. Um, it is now 10.50. We're going to start back at 11 o'clock on the dot. Remember, there's a coffee room with lots of coffee. There's lots of water. Um, let's all be back here. Ayana will start at 11, more or less, on the dot. So.
Let's not miss that.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the introduction to try to keep us reasonably on time. And I'm still hoping that there might be at the end enough time for a few questions and answers. If there are, then I'm going to, if we have enough time, I'm going to ask the participants to come back down and take a seat here at the table so that we can all be sitting here for any questions that come up. Um, I'm also going to be speaking after Ayana. I'm going to be reading Ken Sassman's paper. Ken is um, in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, had all of his um, flights canceled, not surprisingly. And I'd also like to just make, um, make a notice about what's happening there, that Florida, everyone there, um, the towns and communities, they're all in our thoughts as we have this conference today. And I think having one of our participants kind of in the middle of it is something that, you know, uh, there are events happening outside there that we want to be aware of. And again, have folks in Florida and coming into the Carolinas in our thoughts as well. So let me get right to it. Ayanna Fleewellen is a black feminist, an archaeologist, an artist, scholar, and a storyteller. They're an assistant professor of anthropology at Stanford and received their PhD at the University of Texas. Fleewellen is the co-founder and current president of the Society of Black Archaeologists and sits on the board of Diving with a Purpose. Their current book project tentatively titled The Will to Adorn Black Women and Sartorial Choice After Enslavement examines sartorial practices of self-making among African-American tenant, sharecropping, and land-owning African-Americans in post-emancipation Texas, Tennessee, and Virginia. Sartorial practices in this forthcoming work are defined as social cultural practices shaped by many intersecting operations of power and oppression, including racism, sexism, and classism, that involve modifications of the corporeal form e.g. scarification, body piercings, and hair alteration, and all three-dimensional supplements added to the body, e.g. clothing, hair combs, and jewelry. They are currently the PI of the Estate Little Princess Archaeology Project, an award-winning, collaborative, community-engaged archaeological project based on the island of St. Croix in the U.S. Virginia I Virgin Islands, and I believe that's what we'll be hearing about today, and the title of Ayana's presentation is The Afterlives of Coral, or the Persistence of Colonial Violence. Thank you. Can folks hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> I'm still in California and half asleep, so please bear with me. <laughs> so thank you again to the conference organizers for all the labor they poured into ensuring we can gather here over the next several days. And thank you, Robin, for the invitation to participate in the session. At first, I wasn't too sure what I would present on and decided to lean into the vulnerability of sharing new work that is just beginning to percolate for me. The dual title of my presentation harkens to my current place of intellectual play and exploration. So welcome to the journey. And I look forward to engaging in deeper conversation during the Q&A. I hope you have time. <laughs> so mind coral here are carved blocks of stony corals cut from the sea floor, lay at the foundation of colonial architecture on the island of St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands and much of the Caribbean. The stony corals, as living organisms removed from their aquatic environments, die, leaving behind a hard exoskeleton that is either carved into blocks and used in masonry or crushed and added to mixtures of lime, sand, and water to make coral tabby. Structures made of coral blocks, mined by and built by enslaved black hands, were erected to withstand hurricane-forced winds and the brutality of African enslavement. And these structures are still standing, scattered across rolling hills, valleys, and urban centers. Here in this presentation, I think through the afterlives of coral, the way coral rests as a reminder of colonial violence that is encountered every day by black and brown residents of St. Croix who still live precarious lives in the wake of slavery in this US territory. So this work for me began on St. Croix at the Estate Little Princess, an 18th century Danish sugar plantation that is now the home of the Nature Conservancy's Caribbean regional headquarters. The Nature Conservancy, founded in 1952, is a global environmental conservation nonprofit and the largest environmental nonprofit in the Americas. 
With the United Nations declaring that 2021 through 2030 be the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, coral conservation efforts have a renewed focus and hypervisibility in public discourse. Coral reefs cover less than 0.2% of the sea floor and support at least 25% of marine species. Our coral reefs are the life force of our oceans while also providing the foundation of tourism and fishing economies across the Caribbean and all across our planet, they're dying at astonishing rates. In May of 2022, the Nature Conservancy officially opened its coral conservation hub to address the fact that in the last three decades, more than half of the world's corals have disappeared, and scientists have estimated that 90% of coral reefs might die within our lifetimes. On the slide here, we have an image of the U.S. Virgin Islands Governor Albert Bryan Jr. at the Nature Conservancy's coral hub opening. And the governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands has stated that the Caribbean is on the front lines of large-scale coral restoration with the erection of the Coral Innovation Hub. And this statement rests coupled with the reality that the Caribbean is also on the front lines of the impact of the disappearance of corals as well. As work by Shapiro and Romaham demonstrate, even within a 12-year period, drastic shifts and coral populations have occurred on the southwest coast of St. Croix, likely in connection with runoff from farm lands. And these shifts in coral populations from bleaching events to the presence of stony coral disease throughout the, U the USVI gravely impact the livelihoods of all residents beyond economic impacts. The loss of, of shallow coral reefs mean that islands lose a defense mechanism against storm surge, which has been increasing and becoming greater, a greater threat year after year as hurricane season brings in stronger and stronger storms and the length of the season spans more across the year. Yet, the human impact on coral populations has a deep history in the Caribbean tied to colonial practices of coral mining for building material that paved the way for large-scale agricultural production on St. Croix by the Danish in the mid-1700s. With the Nature Conservancy's coral hub located at the estate Little Princess, new scientific techniques are being born against the backdrop of this historic violence against the environment and indigenous and black people. So archeological work at the estate Little Princess, and I should highlight, I don't know why I don't have it in a presentation, um, co-directed by myself along with several other colleagues, including Justin Donovan, Alicia Odawale, Alexander Jones, and William White highlights the intersection of environmental conservation and cultural preservation needs that are often ignored in the rhetoric used in most environmental conservation circles. Slowly but steadily, we have seen the TNC staff on site begin to think about their work in the context of the historic legacies of colonization. And how could they not? When the very structures that they operate out of are built of the very coral species that they work tirelessly, tirelessly to propagate. On the slide here, we have a map of the estate from the, 1970, from the 1980 National Register of Historic Places. The surviving historic structures include the planter's house, the, the hospital, the overseer's house, the sugar factory, distillery building, sugar mill, well tower, and several outbuildings, including the remains of an enslaved village area. The TNC operates out of the hospital, the former hospital site here, as well as the planter, the former planter's home here. So a brief history of the site itself. The estate Little Princess was established by Danish Governor Frederick Moth and Peter Heiliger in 1749 to operate primarily as a sugar plantation, just 16 years after Denmark purchased the island from the French in 1733. Moth sold the plantation to then Governor Peter von Scholten in 1834, which is just 14 years before von Scholten signed the, free, the act freeing all enslaved in the Danish territories in 1848. Over the years, the plantation estate expanded to accommodate a growing enslaved population, and new structures were added, at the added as the production of sugar and rum shifted from wind to steam power. Sugar remained the primary commodity, but ground provisions were were also cultivated to varying degrees. At its height in 1771, the estate accounted for 141 enslaved individuals and encompassed 200 acres of land. After 1848, after the 1848 abolition of slavery on St. Croix, the plantation continued to operate with low-wage labor 
and the plantation began to fall into disrepair during the first half of the 20th century with the general decline of sugar production on island. And in 1949, 200 years after its initial inception as a sugar plantation, the estate was sold to Clayton and Opal Shoemaker as a summer home. So the occupational history of the site is quite unique. The estate ceases to function as an active plantation for sugar production before the start of the 20th century, but people are still living at the site well into the 1960s, meaning that the history of the site spans over 200 years, making it one of the oldest plantations on island and one of the last to close its factory doors. In 1991, the estate was willed to the Nature Conservancy after the death of the shoemakers. So as with other plantations and historic buildings on island, many of the structures were fashioned with a combination of coral and lime and coral tabby and coral blocks that were mined from the nearby sea floor. And while the extent to which coral mining occurred has yet to really be quantified, forthcoming work by Dr. Dustin Donavant, one of the co-directors of the project, is really interested in conducting geochemical analysis of coral species used in historic structures to strengthen hypotheses that draw closer and clear connections between the environmental degradation that occurred underwater and that on land during Danish occupation. So traditional rhetoric of coral restoration efforts are really ruptured at the estate as coral visible in the edifices of the plantation landscape really signal the colonial ties to environmental de degradation, violent indigenous displacement, and African enslavement at the foundation of our present calls for restoration. And the estate Little Princess is but one example of the way coral, via the structures built out of it, produces intercultural spaces where violences of the colonial past rupture the present and really work to collapse time, highlighting the persistence of colonial violence. And these ruptures occur across the island, resulting in and resulting in linear temporal distinctions of past, present, and future really being called into question as the physical and material impacts of colonization, the exploitation and extraction of environmental resources and black and indigenous life continues from the colonial period into the present. That past is encountered and experienced as quotidian by residents. These structures are the very homes that they still live in, the churches that they worship in, the walls of the schools that their children attend. So this presentation is really concerning itself with those coral encounters as a means of demonstrating how coral really collapses time. Quotidian and tacit encounters are conceptualized as passive, and those declarative and spastic encounters are articulated as active. And once again, I'm an intellectual play with, with all of this. So. An example of a passive colonial encounter as quotidian and tacit are some of the schools on St. Croix that are composed of architectural elements from former plantations. So we turn to the Lowell McCullough Elementary School on St. Croix that's built atop the Queen's Quarter Estate 26, a former Danish plantation. And the school's main structures, for example, the classrooms and libraries, are housed in the historic structures made of coral blocks that have been renovated over time. These historic structures were often areas of the plantation where the most arduous and dangerous forms of enslaved African labor were required. So the Queen's Quarter Estate was purchased by John Maddox in 1738 from the Danish West Indian Guinea Company three years after, De after Denmark purchased St. Croix from the French. And the estate encompassed 137 acres of land, making it one of the larger estates on island. And at its height in, in 1782, it accounted for 304 enslaved laborers. So here on the slide, we have the bronze plaque that lays on the facade of the library, and it reads, the Lowell McCullough Elementary School Library, formerly the boiling station of the Queen's Quarter Estate 26, built during the 1700s. What is now, what is now the Lowell McCullough School office was once the home of the overseer. What is now the cafeteria that, that what, was, what is now the cafeteria was once the building that housed work animals. 
What is now the bell tower used to signal to students work and labor flow was reconstructed in the, in the 1970s by the Department of Education, was once used to call enslaved Africans to their workstations. The landscape that once disciplined and commodified enslaved Africans now disciplines and educates, which arguably is a form of disciplining as well and certainly a form of socialization, afro kurujan youth. And on this slide, we see the elementary school playground in the, four, in the foreground and the base of the former windmill um, used to extract juice from sugar cane in the background. And um, this was actually how I initially encountered the Lowell McCullough School. I was doing a tour of St. Croix, really trying to gauge just how many of its elementary schools are on plantation spaces and how they've been built into um, various um, plantation structures over time. And the Lowell McCullough School is unique in that it has um, some of the most renovated areas really built into the very central framework of school and the production of, of education in that space. So when you drive up to this space, what you see are several dozen afro kurujan youth running around this playground. And in the background, you see this windmill. And the, what was so jarring about it was, A, the space of play, but then also speaking with the teachers who then didn't quite know how um, to incorporate the, the actual history of the space within their curriculum outside of these kinds of um, one-pass kind of commentary. So it's not built into the actual curriculum of, of what's taught at the, at the school or more broadly um, within educational frameworks on St. Croix. Um, so I'm, I'm really just interested in, in with that, I'm, I'm really just playing with, I should say, um, what that really does. And I also, so one other story just to add to it, that my interest in schools at this particular, um, on this particular island came up because during our archaeological work, which is very community collaborative in practice, um, one of the uh, college youth who was excavating with us in 2019 mentioned that her elementary school was built on a plantation and that the detention spaces that she would attend at that school were held in a dungeon. And I was like, what is she talking about? Um, and then the pandemic happened and we weren't on island for two years. So I've been sort of thinking about, you know, not only the kinds of... Um, the kinds of narratives that are built around these places, but then also what are the kinds of stories that are then being digested by students as they grow up in these landscapes um, as well. So spaces of education like the Lowell McCullough School where colonial structures act as ruptures and conceptualizations of time serve what I'm calling as palimpsestral reminders of how the past and present collide and beckon us to consider how plantation long logics pulling from anything really undergird the imperial project of the United States. So switching to active encounters, artists on St. Croix are really working to make these otherwise tacit encounters with the past hypervisible, with coral being used as a medium. And in this way, the encounter with coral as signifying of colonial rupture is declarative. It's spastic, it's intentionally curated in this way. And because of that, I'm articulating it here as active. So these two pieces, Levon Bell, um, are, are created by Levon Bell, this piece right here. And then this one is, um, this is a co-produced a co piece with another, another artist. But Levon Bell, a, a Crucian artist, um, born and bred, as her artist bio states, makes visible the unremembered borrowing from elements of architecture, history, and archeology, span Bell really creates narratives that challenge colonial hierarchies. And this piece to the far right, titled Trading Post, um, articulates, it's called Trading Post, Articulated Hierarchies and Visible Displacements, that's seen on this slide, um, is a sculpture of coral stones encased in plexiglass that were, in her words, reclaimed as Bell puts it, from the ruins of historical buildings in Christianstead, one of two urban centers on the island of St. Croix. So Bell's work really makes hypervisible the ways that coral mediates and collapses time, right? 
Her coral, here, coral as an intercultural object, as art and artifact is used to highlight how black labor in the past and present as foundational to wealth produced by colonial and now imperial enterprises are um, invisibilized. So bringing the, story, the coral to the forefront then makes it hyper visible for her. In the store, in the, in the core, of course, the corals themselves were cut by enslaved Africans and formed the foundation of these colonial buildings, one of which is her art studio that she works out of. Um, and the second piece here, she pulls this trading post um, piece here into the kind of plith for this, um, this particular sculpture, which is called I Am Queen Mary. And I Am Queen Mary is one of the earliest um, revolutionaries on, um, on St. Croix that really brought about the kind of ending of sharecropper um, policies and practices on island. And once again, it's pulling in so many different um, traditions and, 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 and iconography, but I want to focus specifically on the fact that um, the use of coral here at the base to show once again the hypervisibility and the calling in of, of black labor and of colonial violence um, in that way. Ooh. So coral as an architectural artifact is the real, as I mentioned, the starting point of this presentation. And here, coral and the structures built out of it I want to stress as these intercultural spaces um, created as the abstract for this panel um, articulates the crossroads of the novel and familiar. And this presentation took a look at, the, at this and these three sort of distinctive encounters uh, with the colonial past mediated through coral, demonstrating the varied ways that this organic material ruptures time and demands us to be, um, demands us to really tend to the persistence of colonial violence. So I conclude with a question, which may sound kind of strange, but it's where I'm at right now. <laughs> um, but I'm concluding with this question of asking how we account for the palimpsestral, for the novel and familiar of objects, like these coral blocks that are imbued with so many histories and meanings by various disciplines, be it the environmental conservationists that we work alongside as archaeologists at the Estate Little Princess, or within the communities that walk past, live in these buildings each day, or by community members like LaVon Bell, um, who have a very different relationship to material culture in the past and the uses of it, the preservation of it, the, um, the recovery of it. Within our own research designs, excavation, recovery, analysis, preservation, and dissemination practices. Thank you. Ayana, thank you so much for that fantastic talk. Um, I'm going to now um, present Ken Sassman's talk for him since he can't be here himself. I'm going to try to, um, he's, he's um, put together, I think, quite a talk for us. Um, and even though he couldn't be here, I wanted to make sure that the work he had put into this was something that the conference got to, um, got to hear today. Um, I think Ken is watching this via live stream from Florida. And I've told him that he is, um, um, I'll expect a review of my performance when I see him, hopefully at SEAC um, next month. But let me go and give him the same introduction that I gave everyone else. Ken Sassman is the Hyatt and C.C. Brown Professor of Florida Archaeology at the University of Florida. After receiving his PhD at UMass Amherst, he worked for 12 years in South Carolina with the Savannah River Research Program before joining the faculty of the University of Florida and launching a long-term project focused on the Middle St. Johns River. His research in both areas centers on the culture history of archaic period hunter-gatherers circa 11,000 to 3,000 years ago. 
In 2009, he launched the Lower Suwannee Archaeological Survey on the northern Gulf Coast of Florida to investigate the material realities and cultural interventions of climate change and sea level rise over the past 5,000 years. Ken's numerous books include Early Pottery in the Southeast, Tradition and Innovation in Cooking Technology, People of the Shoals, Stallings Culture of the Savannah River Valley, The Eastern Archaic Historicized, and with Tim Pocketat recently, The Archaeology of Ancient North America. He has authored or co-authored dozens of articles and book chapters, and the title of his presentation today is Gathering and Ungathering in Circles. We are gathered here on this special occasion to think about an archaeology of intercultural spaces. At face value, the term intercultural connotes some sort of interaction between members of distinct cultures, however those are defined, and the spaces in which those interactions occur by, are by definition intercultural. One might think of Plymouth, St. Augustine, Fort Ross, and countless other examples of spaces of colonial interactions between people whose cultural differences could not be more stark. And yet, we have the benefit of decades of research on intercultural encounters involving European colonists and indigenous peoples in the Americas to know that the simple dichotomy between natives and interlopers fails to capture the diversity of either group. I thus hope to contribute here to an examination of intercultural spaces of indigenous people themselves before, during, and after the recent period of, coloni of colonialism. My thesis is actually quite simple. Many of the indigenous peoples of North America, since the early Holo Holocene, gathered in large numbers to intervene ritually in the course of events. They often did this in circles of bodies and architecture, in third spaces or places where cultural differences were subdued in moments of common purpose. They sometimes involved places of permanent residence for host communities, and in others non-residential places, often situated between residential communities. In all cases, the motivation for gathering in large numbers traces to existential threats transcending cultural boundaries, colonialism, disease, drought, flooding. To the extent they involved peoples who spoke diverse languages, gatherings required a lingua franca, verbal or otherwise. Arguably, each gathering centered the world for those gathered in circles. Forces emanating from the axis mundi of circles were activated by dance, song, and prayer. Gatherings were, by design, meant to ungather, enabling constituent communities to return to first and second places of daily living where cultural differences were reproduced in non-discursive practice. Some of this is familiar to our understanding of indigenous cosmology and rituality from literary and ethnographic sources. Here I aim to push beyond the familiar to consider how gatherings in circles in the ancient past of Eastern North America compared to intertribal gatherings of the colonial and post-colonial worlds in both form and purpose. I start with the ghost dance among Native Americans of the late 19th century American West, a subcontinental movement that spread quickly among dozens of tribes speaking multiple languages. I then turn to the upper Shingu Valley of the Amazon for a contemporary example of regional gathering involving eight tribes speaking three different languages. I close with the Poverty Point site of Northeast Louisiana, where in the closing decades of the third millennium BP, thousands of people from across eastern North America converged to redirect the course of history. In 1889, a Paiute prophet by the name of Wovoka envisioned an end to colonial expansion and a return to indigenous sovereignty if his people could bring the spirits of their ancestors to intervene on their behalf. A ritual innovation that came to be known as the ghost dance, Wovoka advised, would reunite the dead with the living and bring peace and prosperity to all native peoples. A modification of the Paiute Round Dance, the five-day ghost dance drew participants from throughout the Great Basin. As it spread across the western frontier, the form and intent of the ghost dance were adapted to existing religious beliefs. Among plain tribes, for instance, the ghost dance was a ritual of world renewal, akin to the sun dance in its healing and transcendental affordances. Within a year of Avoca's vision, news of the ghost dance, and in most cases its practice, reached just about every tribe west of the Mississippi River. 
Historians generally agree that the ghost dance itself was responsible for intertribal connections across the reservation system intended to separate Indians from one another in the interest of settler colonialism. However, Historian Justin Gage demonstrates through analyses of letters and travel records that intertribal networks began to take shape in the 1870s. These earlier connections among reservations helped to galvanize political and military resistance to U.S. policies. Using the literacy of English foisted upon them, the postal service and telegraph used to monitor them, and the railroad that catalyzed Western land dispossessions, Native leaders allied to resist government impositions long before Wovoka had a vision. The rapid spread of the ghost dance did not create networks per se, but rather was made possible by these long-established connections. These same networks of communication and visiting, and visiting facilitated large intertribal gatherings at which dancing and other collective rituals took place well before the reservation system imposed challenges to intertribal gatherings, annual sun dances among Plains tribes were public festivals that drew participants from across the region. Government suppression of the sun dance in the mid-1880s only accentuated the growth of networks, and it never fully stopped intertribal gatherings, which were almost always accompanied by dancing. Many whites who commented on these events, including military personnel, downplayed the threat because they understood the nonviolent ethos of native dancing, particularly the ghost dance as espoused by Wovoka. Still, intertribal gatherings were at times massive, causing concern among those who expected the reservation system to keep Indians apart. The ghost dance, sun dance, and round dance, among others, were circle dances. When performed indoors or in the plaza of a fixed settlement, the scale of circle dances was constrained by architecture. Portable architecture, such as Plains teepees, provided options for circular settlements of flexible scale. When large groups gathered, a camp circle was formed, leaving a central space or plaza for ceremonial structures and activities, like dancing. Among Plains tribes, camp circles were spatially structured to accommodate differences among those gathered. Although many analysts have commented on the inherently egalitarian nature of life in the round, the Plains examples remind us, as did Levi Strauss with examples from across the Americas, that circles may embody all manner of social distinction. The Plains examples also underscore the cosmographic nature of camp circles as world-centering, fitted as they are by ritual infrastructure in the central plaza and its eastern openings to the rising sun as world-renewing. Like their indigenous counterparts throughout North America, the Quicuro people of the upper Xingu River Valley of the Brazilian Amazon bear the brunt of colonialism. Uninvited impacts continue as farms and fires encroach on land they've occupied for the past 1,500 years. After recovering from a demographic nadir in the 18th century brought by disease and slaving, the Quicuro are reimagining the past through the archaeological residues of their pre-colonial history. What is gleaned from these residues, largely by Mike Heckenberger and colleagues, is a terraformed landscape of interconnected circular villages among multiple polities. The greater Xingu people today consist of 15 different tribes, the Quicuro among them, with speakers of all four of Brazil's indigenous language families. Despite the linguistic diversity, Xingu peoples are united in a range of beliefs and ritual practices, all centered on open plazas enclosed by circular villages that are today approaching the scale and integration of those of the pre-colonial past. In August of 2022, I accompanied Mike Heckenberger to the Quikuro village of Ipatse to witness the Kwarup ceremony hosted by the Paramount Chief and two other hosts. The Kwarup is a traditional ceremony of reverence for leaders who died in previous years. It ends the mourning over lost ones and reinforces collective struggles and resistance of all Shingu peoples. The host village was founded in 2020 as its predecessor to the immediate north was abandoned. Consisting of over two dozen large houses encircling a plaza of some 300 meters in diameter, Ipatse represents recent growth in the greater Quikuro population, now approaching 700 people. Joining the three-day Kwarup ceremony were several hundred guests from neighboring Shingu tribes. Indigenous participants totaled over 1,200 people, with constituents speaking three native languages and most men also speaking Portuguese, the lingua franca of Xuinganaros. 
In keeping with the topic of this session, my interest in the Quadrup is with its intercultural spaces. The plaza is the most relevant space in this regard. It is where all communal ritual takes place to the immediate east of the men's house and amidst the unmarked cemetery at the center of the plaza. Throughout the Shingu, plazas are powerful spaces, not only the axis mundi of centered worlds, but also the locus of sacred authority, not accessible to everyone. The village demarcating the plaza is itself structured with authority. The house of the primary chief occupies a position on the east and the house of the secondary chief on the opposing western margin. The men's house just west of the center in the plaza where sacra are stored is an especially exclusive space. Also of note are places just outside the village compound in the forest that accommodate temporarily that accommodate temporarily guests from other villages. This arguably is liminal space between village and forest. Secluded guests emerge from the forest on two occasions over the three-day karup, at night on the second day when men steal the sacred fire, and on the morning of the third day when everyone converges in the plaza and partly separates into groups based on tribal affiliation and gender. Certain members of residential host families, notably uninitiated women, also remain secluded for much of the Quadrup, in their case within residential buildings. The Quadrup sprang to life the first day with pairs of male flutists accompanied by uninitiated women making the rounds literally from house to house. Appropriately adorned, generally older men gathered outside the men's house in the afternoon. Two singers collected the spears, headdresses, and rattles of their appointed role and sustained song as about 250 younger men from host families aligned in a large circle of counterclockwise rotation. They came to a halt and turned inward, launching into synchronized vocalization and bodily movement, stomping incrementally towards the center until closing in tightly for rounds of competitive wrestling. After one-on-one -on -one matches among champions, the younger men and boys engaged in more spontaneous wrestling, which got raucous. All matches ended quickly and amicably, usually in draws. Thirty minutes later, most of those gathered assembled into a single dance line oriented north-south bisecting the plaza. With the simultaneous rhythm of the two singers in front of the men's house and a collar in line, dancers oscillated north and south across the plaza for about twenty minutes. Physical traces of the dance lingered a good while longer. As night fell on day one, flutists made their rounds. At dawn, men assembled in the plaza to emphasize, to emplace and personify quadruple tree trunks for the honored deceased. They started by digging three post holes, one for each honoree, measured to precise tolerances by a chief. Spaced several meters apart, the three holes aligned along a north-south axis. After emplacing human-sized trunks into the holes, men used machetes to strip the bark from a 20-centimeter band encircling each trunk about stomach high. Against the painted white background of the striped, stripped bands, men painted in red and black the motifs specific to the status of honorees. As the painting continued, other men sorted colorful yarn into piles to be distributed to all participating families. Shortly after, the host families, including the paramount chief, assembled under the awning of the men's house to have their hair and bodies adorned for the evening ceremony. In mid-afternoon, two singers resumed their position and sang in front of the men's house. After the flutist passed through, the assembled men proceeded to the center of the plaza to form two dance lines that again oscillated north and south for about 30 minutes. They were joined by two lines of uninitiated women and girls to the east. At the end of the dance, family members converged under the awning to erect. I think I may be getting ahead here. There you go. At the end of the dance, family members converged under the awning, erected over the quadruple trunks to dress their deceased relatives in colorful belts, other adornments, and finally headdresses. Next, two singers offered songs to each of the honorees and their families. As night fell, three sacred fires were lit for each of the honorees just to the east of the trunks. About 30 minutes later, men from guest camps outside the village ran into the plaza in a counterclockwise rotation and stole burning sticks from the sacred fires to ignite fires back in their own camps. Accompanied by song, mourning continued through the night. 
At dawn on the third and final day, men from host tribes entered the plaza in the familiar clockwise rotation, forming a massive circle that soon stopped and closed inward with rhythmic stomping and calling. Shortly thereafter, all guests from camps outside the village appeared from the northwest carrying their possessions. They divided into five groups along the eastern perimeter of the plaza. Men of these groups joined the men of host tribes in a second circle dance, this one twice the size of the first, nearly the entire width of the plaza. They soon turned inward, stomping in rhythm to the center. When another round of wrestling ensued, first one-on-one, -on -one, and then freestyle, which brought the three-day group to an end. The vibrant, real-time ritual practice of Karup, much like the ghost dance, ought to give pause to any archaeological inference about encircled gatherings that overlooks the cultural diversity of those gathered as if the conditions of colonialism were exceptional and thus unparalleled in the long arc of history. In the eastern woodlands of North America, where I work, Large circular arrangements go back to Paleo-Indian times at places like Bull Brook in Massachusetts and as late as the Mississippian period on the South Atlantic Slope. They show up in particular places for relatively short periods of time, often, I suspect, as ritual interventions against the circumstances disrupting the familiar, as colonialism did in so many ways. The gatherings of Poverty Point in Northeast Louisiana serve as a good case in point. Poverty Point, as we know it today, consists of the enduring traces of a massive terraformed landscape of several mounds, including the second largest north of Mexico, and six concentric half circles enclosing a plaza 600 meters in diameter. Its history of intense activity spans five centuries, and its ancestry goes back at least another 1,500 years. Its deeper past notwithstanding, much of Poverty Point took form in its final century when ridges were erected from extant midden. Mound A went up in a matter of months, and timber circles up to 62 meters in diameter were emplaced and dismantled repeatedly in the plaza. What is not well known is the scale, composition, and permanence of Poverty Point's population. Regional specialists generally agree that the place supported a residential population, but how big and how sedentary are unknown. Still, coupled with the geographic scale of material culture delivered to this place, spanning nearly half the continent, the labor requirements of the largest terraforming project reached 2,000 people, so the population swelled occasionally with visitors from far and wide. I agree with Spivey and colleagues that gatherings at Poverty Point were akin to religious pilgrimages and were thus rife with ritual activity. We may never know, like we do for the ghost dance or the karup, the form and meaning of ritual activity at Poverty Point, but we are not without some good leads, starting with its massive circular plaza. Poverty Point's plaza is indeed immense, equal in size to the Grand Plaza of Cahokia, a place of intercultural encounters and heightened rituality. In artists' renditions of these places, the plaza of Poverty Point appears as a center of place in converging lines marked by aisles that divided concentric half-circles into six segments. Aside from the single mound to the northeast of its center, the plaza is devoid of features and thus portrayed as inactive space. Renditions of Cahokia's Grand Plaza are instead bustling with activity structured by mounds, posts, and a chunky field, all surrounded by additional mounds, craft barrios, a palisade, and the panopticon of Monk's Mound to the north. And here's just an image contrasting an artist's rendition of the relatively inactive poverty point with all of the hustle and bustle going on in the artist's rendition of Cahokia. The barren appearance of Poverty Point's plaza is deceiving. Recent geophysical survey by Hargrove and Hargrave and colleagues reveals evidence for at least 36 timber circles ranging in size from 8 to 62 meters in diameter. These are the traces of closely spaced in-ground posts arranged in enclosed circles, each presumably unroofed and with an opening large enough for a human to pass through, but otherwise devoid of features. Concentrated in the southern half of the plaza and adjacent to the inner ridge, timber circles were evidently erected, dismantled, and rebuilt repeatedly. The largest cluster consists of nine circles, among them five of the largest. 
Radiocarbon assays on charcoal from select posts show that rings were erected throughout the multi-century history of Poverty Point, but possibly at greater frequency and scale over time. I refrain from speculating on the, on the substance of activities taking place within timber circles, but agree with Hargrave and his colleagues that they housed communal events that likely involved feasting, and I would imagine also dancing. The size of groups using circles must have varied with the size of circles, whereas the smaller ones may have, project, have projected circumferences of about 25 meters, the largest reached nearly 200 meters allocating half a meter per person in a hypothetical circle dance, the size of groups ranged from 50 to 400 people per circle. It would take five large circles to accommodate the labor party estimated by Kidder to wreck mound A, but if divided by gender, as in the Karup, only half that number. Inasmuch as circles were erected, decommissioned, and rebuilt repeatedly, ritual involving circles had a cyclical quality, perhaps indexing those of the cosmos. We already have a good sense that the totality of Poverty Point's terraforming materialized solar events, and its timber circles may have as well. I imagine that solar events and cycles that could be seen by anyone provided the lingua franca of communication that synchronized the movement of persons from across much of the eastern woodlands to converge at Poverty Point for ritual gatherings. But why gather? If the ghost dance and quadruple gatherings or any guide, intervening against existential threats is the ultimate goal, and in joining the spirits of ancestors to assist with this, the immediate goal. While this clearly was the intent of the ghost dance, the intervention purpose of Quadup is not so obvious. However, in the time between ritual acts over three days, chiefs from gathered tribes consulted with one another about shared challenges, specifically encroachment on indigenous land, not unlike conditions on the late 19th century plains. I imagine that Poverty Point involved a different sort of challenge, namely climate change that disrupted traditional land use practices. Kidder and colleagues have documented flooding itself associated with a neoglacial episode at the end of the third millennium when Poverty Point was abandoned. In the previous centuries, while Poverty Point was coming into form, much of the Atlantic and Gulf coasts was abandoned. Disruptions were pervasive, and I suspect that pilgrimage pilgrimages to Poverty Point intensified as more and more diverse peoples sought guidance about uncertain futures. Kidder imagines eschatology at play. The outcome after abandonment was a great ungathering when dispersed small-scale and mobile, season, mobile settlement, not unlike ancestral times, was sustained for centuries to come. To conclude, Gathering in circles unites disparate groups in common purpose without subordinating sovereignty to collectivism. Synchronized bodies in motion, like the celestial bodies they emulate, ensure renewal and thus futures, while the interactions of persons of diverse experience and heritage invite the innovation necessary to negotiate adversity when the familiar is disrupted. Intercultural spaces enable the intercultural synergies needed to overcome common adversity, from colonial intrusions to disease to widespread climate impacts. An archaeology that privileges the interventions of collective bodies against disruptions to the familiar decouples rituality from the usual material causes or the impotency of epiphenomena and situates it in generative space, in the intercultural space between tradition and innovation where history is made, not simply lived. Thank you. On Ken's behalf. And Ken, thank you for that thoughtful paper if you're listening on live stream now. We have, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers. That'll put us about five minutes or so over our lunch break. If the participants could all come up here um, it may be easier to handle questions and answers and microphones um, if folks are sitting here at the table rather than um, having to have microphones running around the place. So you guys come up and take a seat at the table. Um, flip your mics on. Flip your mics on if you're answering a question. Everybody just have a seat. You can share mine. <laughs> and I'll um, um, reach out if we... Let's see. Um, um, are there any questions for the, for the group or for individual papers in the group? Come on, we brought everybody down here now. Surely we can find a great... Yeah, Mike. I have a question for Grace. Sorry to push you in the spot. Um, are the Poverty Point circles, are they 
business groups that Carl Booth had contacted, worked with, and interacted with, are they still present in the territory? And are they aware of the work that was done by him? Uh, my question was, are the indigenous groups that Carl Gutha in, interacted with in his archaeological work, are they still there, and are they aware of the collections and the history of the work done amongst them? No. Um, if you look at his diary, it doesn't even mention the ethno-linguistic groups, um, but he does mention the, lo the, the locality, the barrios, the sitios, um, so you'll get an idea of who was occupying um, these places at the time of his visit. Um, but as far as I know, um, there, there's no clamor or there's no uh, call for, for these materials to be returned. Because they're not aware, basically. Thank you. I think Amanda saw Amanda's hand. Amanda? Hi, um, so this question is for Dr. Fluellen. Um, amazing paper in so many ways. I love the interlinking of environment and colonial violence and everything. Um, to me, it was very poignant the, the, how schools are in um, these, these sort of remnants, coral remnants of colonial violence. Um, and I wondered if there'd been any interaction with the children who go to these schools and their sort of um, takes on this, if this sort of history is taught, but also sort of their sort of lived experience of learning in, and be educational disciplines sort of in these sort of skeletons uh, of colonial violence past. Thanks, and present. Um, <laughs> okay, oh, okay. Um, so I have not um, done any research with students who are um, attending the schools themselves. At the Estate Little Princess, a part of the archaeology project that we have in collaboration with archaeology in the community, we have about 15 to 20 youth that are part of the Caribbean Center for Boys and Girls, so the Boys and Girls Club, essentially, on island, um, come out to our site. and excavate alongside us, learn um, archaeology theory and method for about two weeks. And that program was designed and based off of the curriculum that's available online. So it fills in the kind of gaps around what is taught in history classes as well as earth science classes for um, ninth through 12th grade students. Um, and what we've consistently gotten from the students who participate in our field school is that this isn't history that is taught in their, um, in their primary education, be it in elementary, middle, or high school, in any sort of deep, um, introspective way. So even the first day where we're introducing just a history of St. Croix and how it was occupied by seven different um, flags at various points in time, um, we all know seven flags, like everyone has like that kind of kitschy like knowledge, but the actual sort of in-depth understanding of enslavement, um, how many of their ancestors were enslaved, if not on St. Croix, on varying islands nearby, isn't something that's spoken of um, readily. And a connection between um, the Lowell McCullough School and LaVon Bell, LaVon has two, three young daughters on St. Croix, and that school would have been their home school. And in conversations with her around this project, she was like, I would never send my student, send my girls to that school. And part of it is because the kind of um, work, A, that she does and, and, and the ways in which that history is sort of imbued in that landscape, she doesn't want her daughters exposed to that. Um, the other part is that it's not being taught um, to the students who are there. So, but those are informal um, sort of interactions, so nothing sort of there's not been like a, a, a systematic survey, for instance, of children experiences. Marty. Um, so my question is for, uh, for Dr. Fowles. I've got two questions, I guess. One of them is maybe pretty easy. So like 
Um, with some of the Comanche rock art, when you're looking at tallies and things like that, is that about people killed or captured or both? And then the second question is um, kind of leading off from, uh, from Dr. Sassman's talk. Um, you mentioned the idea of like, of like trade fairs um, in like, I think Taos Pueblo. And I'm wondering th about the trade fair as like an intercultural space. Um, do you see a kind of like similar spatial logic, like a circular orientation? Because if I remember correctly, I think Taos Pueblo is like a plaza centered uh, Pueblo with room blocks surrounding it. And I wonder if there's a, like a consistent, maybe like spatial organization um, that, that might be a play there. Yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, I'll, the second question is easier to answer. Um, you know, it's it's not a circle <laughs> on the plaza. You know, um, uh, today if you go to dances at Taos Pueblo, it's actually a moving ritual that will go from um, you know plaza to plaza. There are actually many sub plazas, and so it's actually the fact of that movement through the community that's important, rather than a single space. Um, uh, you know, the first question is a little more complicated. Um, there's a lot to say about the tallies out there and what a tally is, you know, um, anyway. I mean, on one hand, there's um, the very obvious tallies which you've got a whole bunch of lines, um, some of which are, you know, uh, you know, have extensions that make it seem like they're being uh, used in some specific way that we no longer know. You know, what their tallies have is difficult to say. On um, some panels, they're literally horses that are depicted and you assume it's a horse tally. Um, um, but most of the time it's just uh, tick marks and we really can't say what the content was. That said, you know, the logic of tallying pervades this art. I mean, every feathered lance is a tally. Um, you know, each of those feathers is, you know, an archive. Um, you know, uh, um, in many cases, uh, the teepees are depicted with lines coming off of them. These are Tallies are everywhere, actually out there in, in one sense or another. Um, so, you know, um, I, I do think that there was an iconographic revolution that led to, you know, this new way of thinking about what images are or could be. Um, and yeah, that sort of archival sensibility is throughout. Um, most of the specificities of it are at this point really hard to, um, you know, to pull from the images, but... Uh, um, yeah, you know, but on the other hand, it's early days interpreting it, frankly. We work closely with the tribe, but as we get more of these images in our database, perhaps there'll be patterns that will help us. So uh, we can tell when Europeans were killed. Um, they always have their uh, um, arms on their hips. That's a, a kind of colonial or a, a indigenous signifier for like white guy, you know, with the <laughs> hands on the hip or the hat line. So, you know, when um, it's uh, Spaniards who've been killed, that's pretty clear um, in the tallies. It's kind of amazingly universal in the colonial world that like, yeah, salt and pepper shaker, that's what they call it out in Taos. Hi, my question is for Dr. Fowles as well. Um, so thinking about the acculturation and incorporation of existing images, um, the, the Comanche then used, um, such as the snake motifs from, that were already prior existing, how do you think that this also connects not just with acculturation coming into this area, but any sense of legitimizing place or space or their occupation landscape by incorporating images and actual tangible objects and materials from groups that were already existing in that place. What comes to mind is also questions or thinking about sites or areas of occupation where you see other groups. So just for example, um, intrusive later Mississippian deposits into sites where other existing groups maybe didn't have direct connection or didn't have um, explicit Mississippian ties and how this kind of folds together with landscape building, community building. Yeah, that, that's interesting. There's a lot in your question. Thank you for that. Um, you know, regarding your first comment about acculturation, I actually don't see this as acculturation at all. You know, I really do think this is more about appropriation and finding, um, things that are useful that they're going to redeploy and reimagine. So, you know, um, uh, although I think there was a lot of learning going on, especially in military contexts when, you know, uh, Spanish, Comanche, Apache, they didn't all speak the same language. They used conventionalized signs and 
that kind of grew into its own sort of world. But, um, you know, with respect to the second part of your question, the uh, incorporation of earlier imagery, um, you know, I, I really do um, listen closely to and follow on the thoughts of my interlocutors in the Comanche Nation. And what's been kind of really interesting working with them is that it has led to different conversations than I have with other, you know, native groups out in the Southwest that I work with. Um, uh, there's a boldness um, and a kind of throw your chest outness that um, uh, was off putting for me at first. Um, I wanted to think about respectful interactions between one tribal community and another and the archaeological record. And, um, you know, for example, might the use of these snake images have been, you know, a way of taking part in um, a kind of localism that was there? You know, I don't think that was the case. I think this really was about coming in and taking over. And I say that precisely because tribal members have said that to me. Um, you know, uh, it's their form of anti-colonialism was to be colonial in return. Um, you know, their anti-imperialism was to, you know, not engage in a kind of victim narrative, but really to sort of say we were, you know, we were building and growing during this period. And I'm honoring that in a way. Um, you know, I, I think that they actually were trying to take over the territories of others and using images in part to do that. Um, so it's been a real learning uh, curve for me working with, with the Comanche Nation, you know, which is, again, leads in such different directions interpretively than, um, you know, my work with Pueblo communities in particular. I'm not sure I answered everything, but thank you for that question. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all um, for the morning, and thank you guys for such fantastic papers today. <laughs> and thank you all for keeping us so close to being on time. Um, that was also great. We will reconvene at 1.30 with the afternoon session.